morning, everyone. Welcome to Pearlside. Thank you for joining us live and online. Let's get excited for the Lord this morning. If you would stand to your feet, let's get ready to praise. I'm going to adjust this.
hearts, oh God, as we continue to worship. Let your joy truly overflow in us. Joy in not necessarily what the circumstances look like at the moment, but joy in the hope that we have in you, in your promises, in your truth. It is so refreshing to remind ourselves of who you are and your love for us, God. Yours is the victory, God, and we will choose to walk in that victory even before we receive it because we know you're a faithful God. So we thank you for this time, God. We honor you. We bless you. Be exalted in our praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In the midst of the battle, I put my trust in you. darkness overwhelms me, I will look to you. When enemy surrounds me and sorrow fills my heart. Your gentle voice reminds me, never be apart. So now I worship, now I declare, Jesus, you've won it all. You reign forever, you reign forever, holy. Find my victory. When every fear is defeated. I know you are with me. So now I worship.
this confidence that you'll finish what you started and God you have never failed and you won't start with me you're present in every step you're patient in every heartache and God you have never failed you won't start with me yes we have this confidence You'll finish what you started, and God, you have never failed, and you won't start with me. You're present in every step, you're patient in every heartache, and God, you have never failed. You won't start with me. We have this confidence that you'll finish what you started. that was more than just song lyrics that's a declaration of faith right there and and just you singing that right now here in the sanctuary you singing it wherever you're watching this you are declaring by faith the victory of God working in your life working in your situation and this is why it's not because of how loud you sang or how hard you believe but it's because of how good God is 
Aren't we grateful that we are in the presence of a good God? Let's go ahead and, and end this time of singing with praising God through our prayers. So pray with me, church. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. And right now as we look around in society, whether it's the politics or whether it's health issues or whether it's even right there in our home, relational issues, it may not seem good at the moment. But we thank you that we are here in the presence of a good God that can bring good at any moment. So even as we are here in your presence right now, we open up our hearts to receive your goodness in our lives, to receive your goodness in the working of every area in us and around us because of who you are. So right now, church, just take a moment and just breathe in faith. Just rest in the peace of God. Soak in in his perfect love for your life. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we thank you that you freely give this love because of who you are. Not how good we've been, but because of how good you are. We thank you for this goodness. We declare it. We believe it because you said it. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the church declare. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Come on. <laughs> Let's give God some praise. All right, well, welcome to Pearlside Church. Welcome to our downtown site. Thank you for tuning in live right now, or maybe you're watching it later. Doesn't matter, doesn't change. God is still good. And so we are so blessed to have all of you joining us wherever you are. And as you're seated, if you can turn to a neighbor, uh, give them a shaka. Let's do the double shaka today. That's how good it is. Remember that commercial, two scoops vanilla. We got two scoops aloha, two scoops Jesus, two scoops Holy Spirit. You can go ahead and be seated. Sorry, I've been, uh, I've been on a staycation for the last two weeks, so just went to the beach a lot. So the local boy in me is coming out. Two scoops, like, oh, I didn't know Pastor Tim speaks pigeon. Oh, bro, I can speak plenty choke pigeon. I know, it's weird, like, no, you can't. <laughs> that wasn't good, so I'll just move on. But good morning again. Welcome to our downtown service. Man, God's going to do some great things today, amen? We're about to conclude our series, Stand in a Moment, but we got some exciting news we want to share with you all. Uh, the first is that as we are entering a very pivotal time in our history as a nation with the elections, um, just with even the fight against COVID-19, we as a church, one of the things we're called to do is pray and bring faith into this land. And we're going to do that this week as a church corporately. We have our Seek Week prayer. We do this every year at this time. It's how we celebrate our birthday as a church. And by the way, turn to your neighbor and tell them happy birthday. This past Friday, Friday, correct Pastor Norman? Yes, this past Friday we officially turned 26. And so we're great. Yeah, give yourselves a hand church. Because the thing is, the church is not a nonprofit organization. It's not a, a four walls in a building. The church is the people. And so really, the 26 years we're celebrating is all the people that have grown with God, that have been impacted, marriages saved, people healed of cancer, people raised from the dead. That's all part of the celebration. So that's part of the reason why we know God's going to do something great today. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, and really, our church is founded on prayer. 26 years of building up faith through prayer, a praying church. So we want to invite you, downtown service, to come pray with us right here in Fuller Hall this coming Wednesday from 6 to 7. And we also, if you can't make that pocket because of prior obligations, we will have pockets going uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at the main campus. Uh, you can go on our website for more details on that. Uh, we are fasting. I know for some of us that is an F word, fasting. But we want to encourage you, don't just pray. But fasting in scripture shows the intensifying of prayer. And we need intense prayers during this time. We want us to be able to hear God succinctly and clearly. And we want to pray with power. So we want to encourage you to fast. If you don't know what fasting is, you can ask Mark Klein. He's not here right now. He's outside. Um, but you can go on our website. We'll have a guide in, in instructing you what fasting looks like and how you can practically start fasting. All right, next week, I know we're talking about today, but next week, we are excited. We're going to do this first time ever on a Sunday morning is our courtyard service next week's Sunday. Nine, yeah, only one person is excited. <laughs> People are like, oh, my gosh, it's going to be hot. It might be raining. <laughs> is it really only one person excited? All right, we got five more. No, we got seven, eight, nine. Okay, it's going up. 
9 and 10.30 services both will be outdoors. The reason why we're doing this, and uh, this kind of leads into the message a little bit, but we want to invite people back. It might be their first step of faith to come back is to worship in an outdoor environment due to safety concerns in their minds and what um, maybe you've read. And this might be your first step in a, a step of faith coming back and joining us in a live corporate worship setting. I am going to preach a shorter message next week. All right? I know it sounds like a miracle, but God can make miracles happen. And the reason why I say that is I know some of, many of you, I, talk, I, t I keep in contact with all the families with young kids that haven't felt safe to come back to church yet. And we know, like, you're thinking, I'm going to keep my kids with me. They're going to be unruly. It's going to be embarrassing. It's going to be a shorter service. Uh, we'll get you in and out. So for those of you guys who are thinking it's going to be really hot, it'll be a shorter service. Uh, bring your own beach chairs. We'll have chairs for you. For those of you who aren't able to carry your own or you just don't own beach chairs, um, we'll have chairs provided for you. You'll sit where you want. And here's the kicker. At the end, you'll have grab and go bentos to take home too. So you get to have worship. Now everyone's excited. That's all I had. To, I should have said that from the beginning, the grab and go bentos. And uh, so whether you're at the 9 or 1030, we got uh, breakfast bento, we got lunch bentos for you, the later service. And we just want to celebrate just what God's been doing in this church. And, and uh, so come and join the live celebration next week, 9 and 1030. All right. So, you know, we got we to gotta bring the sermon on. And, and I'm grateful. I know he doesn't like, like these long-winded speeches. But really, if it wasn't for the faith of Pastor Norman and his wonderful wife, Faye, um, stepping out, starting this church on the Hill of Pro City 26 years ago. Many of us wouldn't be here today. So let's give just our gratitude and love and welcome for the faith of Pastor Norman as he shares today's message. Thank you, Pastor Norman. Can't do Thank hugs you, you right know, now. Yeah, I am awkward. I, I don't like a lot of attention, uh, so I do appreciate the accolades. Thank you, but you know, if you were not here, um, we wouldn't have a church. And you, you heard the Lord, and you're here. God sovereignly ordained it, but also you heard the Lord, and you're here, and so we're the church, so I applaud you. Um, we speculated that you were worshiping at Staples Center last week, so it's good to know that you were at, actually at the beach, and your pigeon doesn't actually sound too bad. What do you think? I'm asked, this is the east side. You guys don't speak pigeon either, I think. Okay, but it wasn't that bad, okay? Yeah, so today I want to close the series with a message entitled, Do Something. It's a real simple, do something. And our text comes out as 1 Samuel chapter 14. Verse 6 is where we'll begin, but let's, let's, let's set the stage. Just before David slays Goliath, couple chapters prior, we find that Israel is in lockdown. How many of you are tired of lockdowns? Okay, I've read the books on lockdowns, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to get tangential with you. But they were locked down. The king was locked down, King Saul, who had lost all his authority, his anointing, and favor from God because of earlier disobedience. The armies of God were locked down. The ministry was locked down. The governmental leaders were locked down for fear of the Philistine terrorists led by the giant named Goliath. So they were locked down out of fear. But while they were locked down, the promise and the power of God was frozen in place until King Saul's teenage son, about 16 years old, named Jonathan. Any Jonathans here? Jonathan. And his armor bearer, or his assistant, who's estimated to be about 14 years of age, decide to do something. So we pick up the story here in verse 6. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. That's a, that's a swear, that's an that's a extreme curse phrase in Hebrew language. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, this is the king's son, come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. And if they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up 
because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. Understand, these are teenagers. Their frontal lobes uh, of their brain is not fully formed yet. This is not wise decision-making and strategy. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. You look at the faith of these teenagers, they're remarkable. I mean, we are talking Bruce Lee, yeah? Jonathan climbed, it's, I'm thinking about you, okay, Hong Kong, all right. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind them. And in that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. Okay, that's pretty amazing for two teenage guys. But then panic struck the whole army. Those in the camp and field and those in the outposts and raiding parties and the ground shook. All right, so the ground shook earthquake sent by God. It was a panic sent by God. The lockdown of fear ended when two teenagers decided to do something. And I think God wants to end a lot of lockdowns right now if there's enough people that will do something. Not just say something, but actually do something. So what do we pull from this narrative? What is the heart of God saying to us in this Kairos moment, in this prophetic hour? Lots of things, but let's pull four things out of this on our 26th anniversary weekend. Number one, don't tolerate what God wants to eliminate. Don't tolerate what God wants to eliminate. Frustration and Jonathan and his armor bearer. Jonathan was so frustrated. He looked at his own father, the king of Israel, who had disobeyed God who had lost his faith and therefore a civilization, a nation that all had all the promises of, of God, the scriptural promises, the stories, the presence, and the power of God at their, at their disposal if they would only believe the Father. I think Jonathan just came to the end of himself, and we know he was frustrated because when you swear a curse for <laughs> uncircumcised, we all know what circumcision is, right? Okay, let's move right along. But God used that frustration as fuel to ignite a fire to turn inaction into action. I want to show you a picture. I mean, Hong Kong again. This is Dr. Li Meng Yang, beautiful woman. Most of you may have heard of her in July. She came out. Chinese ophthalmologist, virologist with a strong epidemiological background. She said the virus was actually crafted in the Wuhan military labs and intentionally leaked. Now, she has been refuted not only by Chinese scientists, but American scientists and global scientists. So my point is not to make a hero out of her, but just to use her as an example, because her, her mother has been apprehended. She has now an asylum in New York She's running for her life, but she's still posting data and science and reports of this very fact. She swears by her life on it. And I, tell, I, tell, I tell myself, what does she have to gain from it? Because she's now separated from her family. She says, I could not live with myself any longer, knowing what I know. And so she believed in something so strongly, she did something. And here's the question, what do you believe in strong enough that you will do something about it? Because I think that's what God's calling for his people to do right now. Anybody can be armchair quarterbacks and criticize them and criticize them and criticize, and I've been that. But what is it that God's calling you to do? One of the things as a former educator, and one of the things, knowing we have a church full of educators and a church full of young people, is this whole deal about in-person learning, distance learning, blended learning. And there is not enough electronic devices to pull that off. So we got frustrated enough that we decided to do something. We, all of us. And so take a look here as we decided to put frustration into action. And just, just a little bit of update on this 26th anniversary weekend that because of you, what we could do. Take a look.
here at Highlands are extremely thankful uh, for ProSide's church donation of 40 Chromebooks as well as headphones for our students to use. I would like to thank the congregation for um, the generous donation um, to the school and especially for our students. As a principal here, I'm very grateful for everything that you guys have done to support um, not only our school and students, but our families. This really means a lot because right now, currently in our community, in fact, all schools are struggling with equipment. Times are difficult right now. You know, I say that um, the students are not gonna work on the academics if their social, emotional needs are not met. Um, we cannot do this kind of work without the community. So we are super grateful and um, we feel blessed. Very lucky to be a part of you know um, your community so thank you and uh, we appreciate everything you guys are doing not only for us but I know for other people so no harm for everything so specifically Lehua Elementary School in Lower Pearl City serves a lot of underprivileged students and so we filled up the rest of what they needed uh, Highlands Intermediate was lacking so many computers we gave them everything they needed now so every student has one then we're making a dent in Pearl City. We're looking at other schools, and people have said, wow, can we afford to do it? We can't afford not to do it. And you, you find a way, because when we have faith in a God who provides for all, we know that you can't outgive him. We know that he blesses those who step out and actually do something. So on this 26th anniversary weekend, that's our video. It's not about who we are, it's more about who he is and how he wants to serve them. And Tim, that's your school, that's your system. Yes. Did you go to Highlands? Yes. You went, see, he's proud of it, he's proud of it. Not as good as Kalakaua, but Highlands and then on to Pearl City High School. Sorry, uh, Chargers. <laughs> yeah, Pigeon is getting even better. With, keep the mask on, your Pigeon sounds good. So, look, it's do something. Amen. And what you didn't see there was the emotion. As our community team prayed for the people, tears manifested. These, they don't know the Lord, but they might be interested in knowing the Lord now. And I want to thank you for being a church of generosity, of selflessness, a church that said, we're just not going to say something. We're going to do something. So give yourselves a hand, would you? You deserve it. More are coming out because there are more needs. We've done a survey of many of the schools. Uh, we found out that Iolani and Punahou don't need any. Okay, just needed to throw that in there, all right? All right, now, what else do we learn? We talk about faith, right? We, we can't afford not to do something because when we follow the Lord's leading, then faith will bring his hand to provi providing. Now, here's the second thing we learn from this narrative. Step out in faith and trust God to do something through you through us, because this happens through us. See, everybody, anybody can talk. It's time for action. Action results in transformation. We go back to our opening text. What did Jonathan say? Perhaps the Lord, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf because nothing can hinder the Lord from saving whether by many or by few. In other words, John, Jonathan understood through the history of Israel's triumphs over centuries that God always worked with a remnant first. He always picked a person, another person, a few persons, and he decided to be that person. And he looked at Grasshopper, his armor bearer. He says, Kung Fu, <laughs> let's go. And the rest is history. Not only did this moment change the narrative of a nation, this became the initial pivot to change the course of history. Because two chapters over David, King David, who also used the words uncircumcised, he became best friends with Jonathan. And those two young teenage warriors ended the lockdown. A lockdown of fear because they chose faith over fear, which is where we started this whole series back in March. And we need to keep choosing that. Now, sometimes 
what we find, Jonathan understood this, somebody needs to go first and act fast before it gets worse. So I'm going to fillet my own pride here and uh, retell you the story again because I get to. It's the 26th anniversary. Um, first of all, before I tell the story, let me show you a picture of an attorney in Hawaii. Bobby, I don't know if he's still practicing. His name is Jim Nicholson. But anyway, this is Jim Nicholson. Let's show the picture of Jim Nicholson, professional Kansas City Chief football player. There he is. He was six feet. He, he, he was an all-pro. He played for the Kansas City Chiefs. How many Chiefs fans out there? Okay, nobody. All right. Uh, he was 6'8", 310 pounds. He played 11 years, I believe, in the National Football League. He came out of Kalihi Valley Housing. He played in the mid-60s for St. Louis. It was an, he was an awesome player. I mean, St. Louis was almost unbeatable in those years. Um, and he's Samoan Caucasian. He had a brother named Michael Nicholson. We were classmates at Kapalama School in Kalihi. I was 11 years old. And Michael was a bully in the school. And uh, I was small. Michael, as you can imagine, was big. You see Jim. Not as big as Jim, but <laughs> sizable. He picked on a girl. I didn't like it. He had, he had been kind of bullying the school. And finally, in a moment of temporary insanity, <laughs> at a volleyball, we are in a volley, mixed volleyball match, she picked on Cindy, this girl named Cindy, and I, I said, I said, bro, you and me behind Carter Hall after school. Okay, we going. And as soon as I said that, <laughs> fear gripped my soul. I could feel my knees. You know, every, every, you have so much fear, your knees start shaking, right? I know what that feels like. And so I said, oh, my God. Make a long story short. You got to show up, right? So in the back of Carter Hall, if you ever go... Into Kalihi, Kapalama School, there's this building that looks like a barn in the air. Anyway, in the back, that's where all the fights, it's a lot nicer now. Plenty of people came out because at last somebody going to stand up to the bully. The speculation was, what does Norman have because he's so smart? Maybe he knows Kung Fu or Karate or something like that. I knew nothing. All I had was a big mouth. And let me tell you what, the fight ended, my friends told me, in about 30 seconds because I got knocked out. I saw stars. Have you ever seen stars, the kind you see in the cartoons? Have you eaten? See, yeah, you actually, those stars look exactly like the stars in the <laughs> cartoons. And I remember coming to, and two of my friends looking down at me like this, going, Norman, you okay? Which is a stupid question. Because of course I'm not okay. I just got taken out by the bully of the school. It was embarrassing. And I, all through the years, actually, I, when, I, when I drive by Carter Hall, I've had difficulty until 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, I decided to pull it out of my, ch my chest of embarrassment and use it as a sermon illustration like I'm doing right now. And as I began to think through the history of it, I went, wait a minute. What really happened after, let me tell you what happened after this. There was a guy named Brian Matsumoto. He was the captain of the JPOs. Okay, all I knew, we called them the Japanese pupule officers. I never knew what JPOs actually meant, that it's, it's Jewish police officers. I didn't think it was cool to be one. They wore cocky pants, white shirts, carried a stop sign, had a whistle, and a dumb-looking hat. So I said, I never will be a JPO. Well, what happened was the captain of the JPOs, I found out his dad was an Aikido Judo instructor, and Brian could scrap. So what happened? Brian heard about what happened. Took the, he sought the guy out, and he took him out. And there was no more bullying in Kapalama school. The climate changed. And I, for years, I thought, man, if only I could have fought like Brian. But guess what? When I really thought about it, I was first. <laughs> Brian never go first. He was the captain of the Japanese Papuli officers. I was Brian's friend. Brian stood up for me. Brian said, okay, that's enough. And he became a law enforcement officer. But that's not where the story, the best story part of the story was. I figured even in my immature 11 year old mind that now Michael understood what getting beat up felt like. So I reached out to him and we became friends. 
And I learned something very early that formed me. These are some of the experiences that have formed me to this. There's about not too many, maybe five to seven episodes in my life that have formed the way I live today. Okay, that's one of them. And I realized he was such a bully, but inside was an insecurity because he had no friends. People were afraid of him. I became his friend. He then became a police officer, an enforcer of the law. And the police officers in our church told me, you know, I'm, you know, five years ago he died. He passed of a heart attack. But he passed as an honorable per member of HPD, not bullying people, but stopping the bullies and the lawbreakers. But Kapalama School changed. But I want you to know, I got beat up, but I went first. <laughs> but also in my immature mind, I thought to myself, why don't others go first? Because I couldn't fight. And I asked the question today, where we live in a pandemic, I wonder who needs to do something that has the ability to do something that others don't have. Yeah, because if everybody does their something, God will do something through them. He chooses to work with us and through us. So here's the third thing we get from this narrative. And this is the stuff I didn't do. Invite someone to do your something with you. Okay? Real low, low baga to go. Michael, you and me in a back of Carter Hall after school. I should have at least invited people because I was not going to take this guy out. And we know in Kalihi, you never fight alone, <laughs> especially if you're Japanese. Well, Jonathan didn't do it by himself. He had his armor bearer. Look it back, verse 7 and 8, do all that you have in mind. His armor bearer said, go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, come on then, we, say we. We will cross over toward them. King Solomon was, was arguably the strongest, wealthiest, smartest king who ever lived the earth, ruled Israel. But he got proud when he got all that power and wealth. And you know what happens when you get proud? You can get arrogant. And when you can become arrogant, you don't really have friends who look out for you. They want something from you. And I believe in the context of that, he writes this in the book of Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not equally broken. And I think, I can't help but as he's writing this book of wisdom, Solomon is reflecting on a life of loneliness that no one wants to get close to someone who's perfect, who's powerful, who's affluent, who's, who's, who's got everything. You know, they, they worship you, they want something from you, but they're not going to hold you accountable. Solomon had a thousand wives, 700 concubines. I mean, I'm married to one wife. That's enough of a blessing. <laughs> Don't read into that, okay? Um, we just celebrated 40 years together, but I, I'm saying he did a lot of things. He worshiped pagan gods. Uh, he degraded from a very holy man into a very ungodly man at the end of his life, King Solomon, for all of his wealth, ended a total abject failure. And he writes here in his reflection that we need people around us. Whatever the something is that you do, don't do it alone. Jesus had 12 disciples. We know this. He sent his disciples out on a mission by twos. We have a church of small groups for a reason. Because we need to emulate communities of faith where no one ever feels alone that we always will do our something with others who stand with us and sometimes those who stand for us. I will be forever indebted to Brian Matsumoto, who, by the way, when we graduated from Farrington, not only could he fight, he was so smart, he was the class valedictorian. All right, it's not like being the valedictorian at Punahou, all right? But a valedictorian at Farrington is still a valedictorian. All the Farringtonians say? Thank you. See? Yeah, thank you for those that didn't go to Farrington that said amen anyway. So, um, sometimes you got to do it. So, I told you last week that uh, we've been, we've been uh, doing weekly coaches' chapels with Coach Todd Graham and his coaching staff. And Coach Graham, who learned a lot from being fired at Arizona State, very humble man now, uh, he's now, it's like, I told myself on Zoom screen, and I'm, how many of you tired of lockdowns and Zoom? I'm tired of Zoom. 
Okay, I'm tired of screens. But anyway, we've been doing this weekly chapel, so he wants me to teach a Bible study, and then we have a small group discussion. And he said, I know I'm going to get in trouble because God has not sent me here to win games. More so, he's called me to win souls and make disciples. It's like, are you with me? So yeah, I was with Coach June. I was with Coach Mack. They tried to, they threatened to fire Coach June three times for praying with players on the field. Separation of church and state. You can't be doing that. You can't be talking about Bible. This is not Notre Dame. You know all that stuff, right? It's not a private school. And so he says, well, he said we're going to do the same thing. And so um, the test came last night. Hawaii beat Fresno State. Yes, at Fresno, right? I was great, 34 to 19. The spiritual leader on the players, Eugene Ford, had two interceptions. Yes, Billy Lyle and Withy, you're doing a good job with him. Uh, but at the end of the game, I told Coach, I texted him. We had a text exchange, and I said, Coach Graham, the play of the game was the huddle, the true victory formation after the game, where he stood up, gathered the team, and then they were joined by others. Take a look. I think we have a picture of it here. Okay, that's part of the huddle. So Coach Graham went out first, and he began to pray a Holy Ghost prayer. And then, not only, it started with the UH team. The Fresno State players joined the prayer huddle. That's what happens when you go first, and you go fast, and you do something that you're not supposed to do. Fresno State is a public school. University of Hawaii is a public school. And the misinterpretation and, and abuse of the tenet of separation of church and state ensconced in the First Amendment was actually established to protect the rights of the church from the state, not the state from the church. The liberal far left has totally robbed the agenda. Knowing the truth of this, He's not doing what he's not supposed to do. He's doing what he's supposed to do. And I thought, one guy stood up, called the players, and the Fresno State Bulldogs, the F word in UH sports annals, end up joining the prayer huddle. I had a moment of pause. I thought, don't let them in. (laughs) for all the nasty things they've done to Hawaii over the years. I, it's a little bit of humor. What do you need to do that you're supposed to do unique and pursuant to your own world that others have said you're not supposed to do, but actually it's the right thing to do? Because we're living in, in that environment. Now, I was with 80 pastors at King's Chapel in Aina Haina having a great time. We got together and we talked about What, as pastors leading our flocks in communities of faith, what is it that we need to keep doing that's right, even though government says it's wrong? We're at that place. And we had a very good time. And you know what? We were all agreed. We, it's the first time we had all come together and everybody was of one mind. We're researching it legally. We want to, we want to examine the legal nuclear option. We want to examine the relational bridges. We want to do everything that needs to be done in order that the kingdom of God, the love of God, the fear of God, and the righteousness of God, and the compassion of God can flood our city. That's what I need to do, and I shared a little bit last week of what I am willing to do. But the question I asked us on this 26th anniversary weekend is, what is it that you need to do? What's your Jonathan and armor bearer move that maybe you should do, you haven't done because of fear or doubt? Because I'm going to tell you, if the church of Jesus Christ just takes a stand, there is an influence in any region of our country that will bow its knee. But when we know to do what's right and we don't, God doesn't move like he can He chooses to work with us and through us, not apart from us, even though he can. He's a sovereign, mighty God. When we started the church, a 15-year-old young boy showed up in my living room because he was attracted to a girl, as many, as is often the case. His name was Tim Ma. And he never left. 
So Tim became part of the company of faith, and we were a small group, and Tim joined up and said, I'll fight for my friends and my generation with you. So Tim, we're going to have an anniversary moment. We're going to let you tell your story um, about L.A. and everything in the next series called No Matter What, but I think that because you became part of the team, why don't you come on up here, and uh, I need to share this with you because... Also, the Lakers won the championship. Amen. Yeah, yes. amen. <laughs> amen. Thank you. So when we were not much, Tim became part of a Pearl side that was just a handful of people. And now he leads this congregation. And he's helped lead our congregation in Los Angeles. And we're going to get to see your former staff member, Jim, uh, very soon at the very end. So let's close with this. We look at this story. Jonathan and Armour Bear, God honors acts of faith that defy the facts of life. Let me say that again. God honors the, fact, the, the acts of faith that defy the facts of life because faith does defy the facts of life. We can't figure it out. It doesn't make sense. There's a risk. There's a consequence. It's not logical. It defies the laws of nature. God is looking for a people that will do something they can't control because if you can't control it, it's God. It's you. You're God. If you can figure it out and you've got every detail micromanaged, you don't need God. When the Warriors took the field last night, they took the field by starting on their knees. I will tell you that. And nobody thought they would win. But something happens when you honor God. You win even it looks like you won't if God is, is in the center. Watch this. You talk about unruly strategy. We'll go back to our opening text, verse 8. Let them see us. Really? That's your strategy? <laughs> Let them see us. And if they say to us, wait there till we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign. This is the sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. Wait a minute. They have the high ground. They have to actually climb up with their hands. In battle, military strategies, once you have the high ground, you have the victory. And what they do, they actually go up to the high ground. I mean, we're talking about Bruce Lee and James Bond together. They're, this is not wise. Why did they do the thing that was illogical to do? Because they knew God had spoken to them, and so that was the sign. And two, two teenagers without fully developed frontal lobes in their brain made an intuitive decision, a Timothy Ma decision, and climbed up. Because for Tim to have joined our church at that time, that took a little insanity. They climbed up, and then God sent a panic. And that became the stage which sets the stage for David's incredible victory over Goliath because David heard about Jonathan. And he went, the king's son, it's possible. If that armor bearer, that slink of a guy can do it, I'm David. I, I killed the lions and the bears and that Goliath. I'll take him out. What is it that you're not doing that you're supposed to be doing? Is it afraid of what people will say? Is it afraid of what relatives will say? Your image will be tarnished. What is it? Get over it. On this 26th anniversary weekend, I say it's time to do something. Amen. And it may be not be something you're comfortable with. So, because they did something, God did something. The Spanish flu, we've referenced that before. I kind of, I'm kind of a Spanish flu freak because I'm trying to get some context to this pandemic. And so, we know the Spanish flu killed 20 to 50 million people, 1918, 1919, which makes the coronavirus a drop in a very large barrel. This is not even close to that breadth and depth of a pandemic. World War I was the spreader, so it was going global because of international armies. It was uncontrollable. It was going viral. In fact, the term viral came from the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu, the word, Latin word named virus was already in vogue. The word viral came from the spread of the Spanish flu virus back in 1918, 1919. 
they were furiously trying to find the cure. And in the process, you have to take risk, but you have to find risk takers. They found them. Jim Frazier, Pastor Jim Frazier is also a movie script writer, prophet like Jim Rafoon. He's a businessman, many, many talents. Tim, when you served with Pastor David Polis in our church in Los Angeles for 10 years, you served with Jim Fraser, so you know the magnitude of this guy. And so watch this as Jim talks to us about the parallel experience back then. Take a look. interesting in the throes of that desperation that the medical community was trying to struggle to find ways to overcome this hideous mountain that was in the way. They ran an experiment because in their frantic race to find a cure, they had to find out how this deadly influenza worked. There was a small island off the coast of California off San Francisco Bay. It was called Goat Island. Goat Island, as you might imagine, was a place that was only really inhabited by goats and was used as a naval base, but it was turned into a quarantine station. And in an act of desperation, the United States Navy and their medical corps asked if there would be any volunteers uh, young servicemen among the Navy that would volunteer to receive the influenza so they could study it in depthly in a controlled way from the very beginning. You know, more than 50 young sailors in the United States Navy volunteered to be infected. In fact, they went to Goat Island and they literally were strapped with the jars of the germs. They inhaled the germs. They were injected with the germs. They were put within the quarantine population, slept with them, and ate with them. What was different about these 50 sailors, first of all, is that 90% of them were Christians. Not just uh, ordinary name it Christians, but Christians back in those days that lived a devotional life of faith. It was interesting to note in the observation of the time that none of these young servicemen were afraid of the disease. And so during the run of this, what the medical science and the doctors and the medical panels were shocked with is not one of those 50 sailors ever got infected. In fact, I want to read uh, to you an article from the Oakland Examiner dated April 12th of 1919. It says the experiments on Goat Island, California, by naval doctors and staff in an effort to learn something about this devastating influenza carry a great lesson that every person should study and understand. Let's make sure we put up that picture as I'm speaking here. They, the young sailors volunteered to become influenza victims that the doctors might study the disease more carefully. Young men had no fear of the disease, but yet were willing and offered themselves voluntarily without regard for their life. They were placed with flu patients. They were given jars of flu to uh, germs to inhale. They were uh, breathed into their lungs, and they even had the flu injected into them. But no cases developed among these 50 sailors. These men had been inoculated. They had been exposed to disease in every manner and had breathed in the germs and had uh, eaten and yet slept with other victims, yet not one of them became infected. The medical community confessed themselves that were, they were baffled. All their ideas about the disease were turned upside down. The doctors are still wondering the explanation. However, in simplicity itself, it was proved by each one of these 50 young men these 50 young men volunteered an act of selfishness and service and upon the, the experiment showed that clearly they did not fear the disease. The Journal of American Medicine would later say that we have underestimated the role that fear plays on our immune system. And the epitaph to that is that we have underestimated the role that faith plays in resisting the disease. Choose faith 
over fear. You're here in person because you've chosen a line of faith and to move the line of faith. Throughout the narrative of Scripture, faith pleases God. Our faith in science cannot exceed our faith in God. I'm saying be responsible, but do something. Jesus came and he became the vaccine. He, the Bible says he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He took upon himself the virus of sin that we would never be victim to it, securing eternity, but also from the time we come to know him, he begins to unveil his purpose and destiny for us. And we get to find out why we're here. It's an awesome thing. We're going to come to communion. Pastor Tim's going to lead us. But think about that. And as he comes, think about this. The Spanish flu killed 20 to 50 million people globally. In the United States, 28% of the population that was a third of what it is today caught it. Not enough for herd immunity. So how did it end? I studied it. They say it was herd immunity. It couldn't have been. Twelve years prior in Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California, the Holy Spirit poured out what we now know to be the Pentecostal revival, the restoration of praying in the Holy Spirit, divine healing, prophecy, and everything. It's one of the great moves in Christian history. And if you'll research deeply, the assemblies of God and Pentecostal churches who believed with faith that God could do anything if we do something, began to attack the virus. And I will suggest to you, because science can't explain it, how did that pandemic end? It didn't end because of science. It didn't end because you washed your hands, wore your mask, withheld yourself from gatherings and watched your distance. They were all trying to figure it out. And a lot of things we say today were being done. Here's what was unique about that time. The churches became hospitals. They served the city and the community. But they attacked this thing supernaturally. It wasn't herd immunity. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. But no one will admit it. But Jim Fraser just alluded to it. Faith over fear. Do something. It may be, we're, we're giving blood this week. Our, our main campus is turning to a blood bank. What Tim's going to talk about has to do with blood, the blood of Jesus. So if Jesus gave his blood, we're giving blood. Many of you have given food, thousands of dollars and thousands of pounds of food. You did something. The Electronics for Education video that we see, we give them thousands of dollars of Chromebooks and laptops and earpieces and, and devices and more is going to come. Can, say, what, can we afford it? We can't afford not to do it. Yes. And God will provide. We're going to continue to do something. The something that God leads us to do, it may not make sense. But then again, if I listened to people who thought they made sense, I would never have planted this church. A lot of people said, you don't have a plan, you don't have money, you don't have anything. I said, well, I have a word from God and enough common sense and faith to do something. 26 years later, full of young people like Tim, who was part of a small crew, were here today. So I think it's appropriate that our congregational pastor here lead us in communion as we come to Jesus, the ultimate vaccine. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Norman. And uh, for those of you who are watching live right now, even if you watch this broadcast later, um, if you can just quickly run to your kitchen, grab Aloha Made, or if you're over 21, you can actually grab the real stuff if you wish. But uh, we want to give you some time right now. Go ahead and, and gather your communion elements as we prepare our hearts as a church and congregation to receive communion together. So let's all stand to our feet after you locate the cup uh, that you received when you came in today. Um, Chris, could we please have 1 Samuel, uh, our opening text this morning, chapter 14. Let's put up verse 12. As we peel the top layer, we're going to revisit verse 12. 
we're going to read to verse 14. All right, I'll, I'll grab my Bible, no worries. It's all good. So as we come to the Lord's table and we remember that Jesus is the ultimate vaccine, it's, he's not just our vaccine against sin, which is our greatest enemy, which he defeated, just as Jonathan defeated the Philistine army that day. But he's also our vaccine against the things that, while we're here on this earth, hinder us from moving forward in God's plan and will for our lives. And that includes depression, fear. And so it's not just the eternal promises given to us by God, but even the power of God at work in our lives right now. And the cool thing, as we're listening to the word today, right, our prayer as pastors here in this church preaching this word to you is that you have the faith of Jonathan to do something, to step out. But as we come to communion, I think it's important to realize that not only are we called to be Jonathan, but Jesus was Jonathan and we're his armor bearers. So whatever step you're stepping out right now by yourself, you're actually not doing it by yourself. But listen to Jonathan's words as he speaks to his armor bearer. Verse 12, the second part, it says that Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Verse 13, Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet. Jesus was nailed through his hands and his feet with his armor bearer right behind him. Then the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. So the victory is through us following in the example of Christ. Jesus did what didn't seem logical. And as we go through communion right now, we remember what Jesus has done for us. We remember that he sacrificed for us. He physically came. And now what we have is the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. So as you remove the top layer, you remember <clears throat> Jesus says in the Last Supper, he t tells his disciples, and he's telling us, this is my body given for you, that he has gone before us already. And so let's hold up that communion element father god we thank you for sending your son jesus to live the life we should have lived and and because of the work of jesus we thank you for the power of holy spirit at work in our lives so that just as the armor bearer just had to follow after jonathan we choose right now to follow the presence of god at work in our lives we thank you lord as you partake let this be an act of faith your first step go ahead and partake Thank you, Lord. You may now remove the next layer holding the cup. And as you hold the cup, it represents the blood of Christ. The reason why we can even be with God and follow after Jesus is because he first invites us. He invites us by dividing the wall of sin and eternity that separate, separated us from God and his presence through the forgiveness of sin, through the shedding of his blood. And because of that, we get to be with him. We get to be victorious with him. We get to walk with him. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you. As we partake of your cup, we remember the blood that was poured out, washing away the, the stain and the shame and the condemnation so that we can walk and step out in faith, not alone, but with you, the power of God working through us because of you. So we thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice in Jesus' name. Go ahead and partake. You may put your cup down or hold it in your hand, but what I like to do is just close this time praying over us right now. So if you can, as a sign of surrender and, and receiving the power of God in your life, you can go ahead and hold up your hand. Jesus, um, today as we heard this word, God, faith is stirring up in our hearts. Right now in this moment, you showed us specific steps and what that looks like, climbing out of our hole of fear into a step of faith. And we thank you, God, that even coming out of communion, it's not about how strong or how brave we are, but it's how much we trust you. It's, a, it's how much we see you at work in our lives and know that perhaps the Lord will deliver us today. And we know, Lord God, you've done it 2,000 years ago. You'll do it today. You'll do it tomorrow. You'll do it forever for us. So whatever that specific step is right now, 
whether it's fear, depression, a relational issue, a business issue, a health issue. God, we take that step forward, Lord, coming out of this sermon. It's more than just a, a, a feel-good message. This is an activation of faith moment at work in our lives, God. And so we pray you take our hand right now as it's lifted up towards heaven. Lead us. As you climbed on your hands and feet up the cross, lead us, Lord God, into, Lord, the eternal purposes that you have for us. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give God another round of praise. Praise God. You may be seated. And as a continued act of faith and worship unto God, right now we're going to receive our tithe and offering. And again, we're so grateful, church, for just how generous and how faithful you've been as God's been faithful to us. Let's go ahead and pray and bless the tithe. And if you're a guest here, please do not feel obligated to give. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that even steps of faith, uh, this is one of them, Lord God, financially, tr continuing to trust you as everything we have is from you. And so we take this step of faith in, in trusting you with the tithe out of obedience, but also even giving, Lord God, out of generosity because of who you are. And so we pray that you bless every giver. We also lift up the tithe and the offering to you. Bless it and multiply it into going beyond the walls of this church and impacting this city for your great name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, we won't do the video for sake of time, but um, this week again, it's, it's Seek Week. So um, that might be your step practically is maybe you've never been in a corporate prayer environment before. And uh, maybe God wants to activate a greater level of prayer. And, and when that happens, you're going to be able to, you know, pray for greater things in your life, hear God clear and more succinctly. So we want to invite you to come join us uh, this week at prayer, whether at our corporate campus. But if you're downtown, I want to really encourage you to come to our Wednesday night right here, 6 to 7 in this room. And then as a reminder, um, next week we do have our outdoor services so practically, after hearing that word, some of you watching right now, maybe you've, through the pandemic, you've never set foot in church yet physically. We thank you for your faithfulness and continuing to join us online and our online congregation. But maybe after hearing today's word, there's going to be faith rising up for you to take that next step. And uh, one thing that I forgot to say for all of us to hear is that Fuller will be a overflow. So for whatever reason, maybe you have a medical condition, you can't be out in the sun long, or for whatever reason, this will be available in here, uh, showing a live feed of what's going on outside. So that will be available for you. Uh, that will be next week. And so we want, we want to encourage you to come, and that might be your next step. For many of us, maybe we've never been in group. We've been disconnected from group. That's where we find our armor bearers in life, uh, practically. Such a great place. So we want to uh, invite you to come, maybe check out a group, join a group if you've never been a part of one or you got disconnected for one. Um, but let's all stand to our feet. Voting. Yes. So with the elections, um, you know, just real quick, Saul was not the perfect king. They, people wanted the king, but Saul made mistakes, and that's why they're in the fear they are in. And some of us, we've been jaded, right, with like, oh, I thought this candidate was going to bring hope. This candidate is going to bring change. And, and some of us, we're kind of like in a hole, and we don't want to vote right now. But, but that's our responsibility as believers. God's given us the right, not just as American citizens to vote, but as Christians to take that step, to cast the vote, not according to our preference and who we think is a nicer candidate or, or better speaker, but who aligns more to biblical values, it's got to be rooted in that. And so maybe you didn't vote yet, um, you know, mail-in ballots and all that. And so we have a few more weeks. And I want to encourage you, do not throw away that mail-in ballot. Pray and ask God through the word who you should vote for. And uh, there's a great book, um, Platt, David Platt, uh, Before You Vote, the book is called. So if you need guidance on how to do that, um, we recommend that book as a church. Feel free to read it. David Platt had Donald Trump visit his church unannounced, unprepared. And David Platt's a real man of God. And it created a maelstrom of controversy. Uh, in truth, Hawaii's role in the presidential election is a non-factor. So let me stand here and say to you, what, what is a factor is who we vote for city council, 
in the House of Representatives, in the Senate, for mayor. You want to look through the biblical grid. Don't ba vote based on personality. Based on policy, yes. on issues, and as Pastor Tim said, through the grid of Scripture. You know, this is such a contentious time. I got even relatives trying to beef me, you know, uh, and they're in our church. Uh, and I, I just, here's what I never, I just tell them, I vote for the person who most will honor the commands, the truths, and the values of Scripture. I don't look at personality. I look at the policy. I look at what they stand for in light of the Bible. So I've never actually fought with anyone about any candidate because once I tell them that, there's nothing because it's not relativistic emotion or opinion. It's not personal. That's great. No discussion should disunify the body of Christ. Just choose not to fight, but choose to do something. Yes. Do your study and vote. That's the something we can do. And be praying for the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, her uh, confirmation to the Supreme Court uh, will be monumental. Okay, I think she will be. I don't think it'll even be close. I believe the Lord has already moved ahead on this. But beyond this today, what's your something? Share the gospel. Restaurants are open now. Okay, uh, I've been talking to people. They've been sharing the gospel exercising faith, being That's in great. places where you can get yeah. together, pray, pray with the sick, share your gospel with people, connect, but take the freedoms our government has given us to extend the influence and the love of our God. Pastor Tim. Great. Well, as you go and leave and do your something today, you also get to do something, which is eat cupcakes with us. So you, it's a grabbing goal, so you can grab on as we celebrate our 26th birthday. Happy birthday, church. We love you. God bless you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>